to do? And this is where I hear you all go, yeah, what do they actually do? Well, here's our chance to define it. So we're going to talk about what we want the global cluster to focus on, to prioritize, but also, more importantly, we're going to try to have a look at some deliverables. What do we actually want the global cluster to achieve? What would be a good one, two, three, four, five years work from our global cluster? And this is your chance to feed in. And everything that you share today, everything you give us is going to feed in to the strategy development, which is going to happen in the coming weeks. So let's go. So role is the first step in the place where we start. And role is absolutely crucial to any organization because one, it helps that organization to identify who they are and to explain to other people who they are, which I know with CCCM can be difficult, right? But it also helps the organization to define the boundaries of what it does. So until you know who you are and what you do, it's really difficult to position yourself as an organization. This sounds wholly fundamental, but so many organizations miss it. Role is most clearly defined through vision and mission. And really clear, really succinct vision and mission statements help you to identify organizations and help organizations to identify themselves and for all the people in that organization or associated with it to know what they're doing and why they're doing it. So vision and mission, what we're doing and why we're doing it. So we're gonna play a game. I'm gonna show you some vision and missions from some fairly famous organizations. And I, I want you to tell me who the organization is. And we're just gonna go a bit crazy today because it's the last day. So if you're discreet and quiet and sensible, put it into the chat. If you're not, just unmute and shout it at me. I don't care, okay? So which organization has this vision and mission? Google? I hear Google. Anything in the chat? We've got Google, Google, Google. Everyone's Googling. The answer <laughs> is Google. Very good. And it's really clear, right? You can tell that's Google just by reading the vision and mission. Here's a tougher one because that was too easy. Who's this? Ted. Wikipedia is a good guess. Ted's a good guess. Someone shouted Ted too. Any more for any more? Got Wikipedia from David A. Answer, it is Ted. So if you've seen the Ted talk, so you know of the organization Ted, that is what they do. Here's one a little bit closer to home. I like that Phil is congratulating Tarek. And oh, there's lots of people suddenly writing Ocha in the chat. Ocha, 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 Ocha. It sounds like they just stood on pins they've left on the floor. Okay, so is it Ocha? It sure as heck is Ocha. That is Ocha. That's their vision and mission. It's pretty succinct. It's pretty clear. It's pretty to the point, right? Who do you think this is? I don't think I need to tell you, do I? That is ours. <laughs> okay, in a word, what do we think? <laughs> so Ashin's for upa, oops. There's some good phrases coming into the chat. Why upa, why oops? Alistair's putting long, Amalia's saying a bit too long. It is a bit too long. And to be honest with you, when I started working with the CCCM cluster, I started to read it and I felt like I needed to go and do a law degree to be able to come back and actually understand what it said. So we haven't concluded this yet and vision and mission are really important. So we need to take a lot of time to do it and we need to make sure everyone's happy with it. But just from the, from the air, like how about this as a sort of vision and mission that might be a little bit clearer and a little bit more to the point about what CCCM does globally. If you like that, let us know, put a thumbs up, give us a wave. If you hate it, tell us. Just some ideas here. Still a bit general, good point from Giovanna. 
Okay, I'm going to leave you with that. So the update on role is that we think this is a bit too wordy and long. This is possibly okay, a bit too general, not quite specific enough. And perhaps we need something that is between this and this, but we're working on that. Okay, your turn. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna ask you to define the role of the CCCM cluster, but I want you to do it in one word. So you're gonna get a few goes at this. So guess where we're going now, you know where we're going now. We are going to a mentee. Um, so on the mentee, I would like you to grab your phone or any other device, put in this code that you have at the top of the screen. So if you're just listening in, 75, 91, 24, 9. And in one word, just use one word, tell us what is the role of the global CCCM cluster. If the role is multiple, if there are several words you need, just use one, submit, submit another one and another one. You've got up to five goes each person. Let's just have a really quick look at this and see what the role is. Improve, I like it, really good. And really rare that organizations see that as their role. Dignify, coordination, accountability. I'm not sure why coordination and coordination haven't gone together, but there's lots of coordinate in there. Coordination is by far our biggest role, it seems. So these words, these titles that you're sharing right now need to form into our vision and mission so we're really clear about what it is we do. I like that dignity and dignify are as big as they are in this group. There's a lot coming in now. So there's a lot of capacity building suddenly growing. Accountability is big there. Support is really big. Support is perhaps the second biggest now, third biggest. The size of the word is based, if you haven't done this before, on the number of people who answer. So you're obviously seeing that more people are saying those sorts of things. If you just use one word, you're more likely to connect with something else. If you use several words, it's difficult for them to connect. Okay, brilliant. Thank you for that. I'm gonna take this away. I'm gonna sit down with the strategic advisory group and we're going to try to shape and, um, and identify what it is that we, we want our, our vision and mission to say. So no rest for the wicked, let's move on. So customers and success are the next two steps along our route. Customers is an unusual term to use when we're talking about humanitarian action because we don't think about customers. We're not a business, we're not selling things. We're providing assistance and support to people. But the reason we use the term customers is because we can separate it a bit from stakeholders. So lots of organizations, every organization has very many stakeholders, people they interact with, people they relate to, people they ultimately effect. But our customers are the people who we have a direct interaction with. So we do something directly for them that then influences all the other stakeholders. And remember, we're talking about the global cluster here now. So the SAG identified that the three customers, the three key customers for the global CCCM cluster were country clusters or other platforms or organizations that take a coordination role in, I guess, a country or regional sense. Camp managers, the people trying to do that work in very difficult circumstances. And finally, other global cluster coordinators so that the global CCCM cluster can interact with these other global clusters and ensure that there is that collaboration and overlap. So what is success? What we mean by success is what do these three groups of people identify as success? What do they need from the global cluster to regard the global cluster as a success? And we had a bit of a brainstorm as the strategic advisory group, but what we also did is put out a survey and we got over 50 responses, which was quite good with some really detailed and interesting responses from people from different parts of the world who are working in camp management 
who told us what they felt they needed, what would be success for the global cluster. And that was really interesting. I'm not gonna show you those now because a little bit later, I'm gonna show you how those feed into our priority areas. Strengths and weaknesses is number four. So having thought a little bit about what the global cluster needs to do and what would success be, that raises the question, the big question, can we do it? Are we capable as a global cluster of doing it? And we had a really, really powerful session, I think, with the SAG, where they stepped back and took a moment and said, OK, let's be really honest. How good are we at doing some of these things? And what you'll see on the screen here are four different areas. So the area in the top left is about this kind of being clear about who we are and what we do and adapting to the external environment. The area on the top right is about communicating, sharing information and being accessible. Bottom left is about networking, communicating, working with other people. And bottom right is about specific capacities and skills. So skills, technical capacities, et cetera. And these 13 items were things that came out as really important in terms of what the global cluster needs to be able to do to be successful. And these scores, how the strategic advisory group scored the global cluster. That's really important for our strategy because we can't go and do these things to fulfill our role unless we recognize where we've got strengths and weaknesses and unless we then respond to those strengths and weaknesses. It also matters in terms of strategy and how we respond to external environments depending on whether we internally are strong or weak. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a moment. So have a look at these and just think to yourself, do I agree? Do I disagree? Are there scores there that I think are too high or too low? Thinking about the global cluster. If you've got some thoughts, throw it into the chat. We'd be really interested to hear. The lowest score here is about global level networking, access and visibility to donors and global actors. Now that's, that surprised me because we're talking about the global cluster here. This is one of their primary functions, and yet they score just under two out of five. Is that fair? Is that too harsh? And then the good scores, what about a, a strong score? The global cluster has a really strong technical capacity at global level. Some really good people who know what they're doing in terms of technical things. 3.8, nearly four out of five. That's a 76% that's a score. Is that fair? Are we that good? Interested to hear your views. Or maybe we just hand the mic over to you. How about that? Let's ask you what you think about strengths and weaknesses. So let's, let's do another one. Let's do another mentee. So grab your phone, same number. But this time, we're going to ask, starting with weaknesses, what would you say the weaknesses of the global CCCCM cluster, sorry, CCCM, triple CM cluster are? So many Cs. Just jot down what you think the weaknesses of the cluster are. And we're thinking at global level. We're not thinking at country, regional, local level, thinking at global level. Just take a minute to do that. Let's see what comes in. Wow, I'm interested with number of people who work there. Is that because there aren't enough people or is it because there are too many people? If you put that, if you wrote number of people who work there, can you send another one in that either says too many or too few? That would help us. A lot here about visibility, communication, external identity. This is really helpful. We can gather these together. We can have a look and we can, we can feed these into what we do next in terms of the strategy discussion. Sometimes a little bit removed from field realities. Communication is coming up several times. The name CCCM, sure, I can't even say it. Must be difficult.
is a little bit here about donors too, a lot about funding and fundraising. I'm interested in this one here about focusing only on technical aspects and missing strategy. I'd be interested to know what's missing there. If you have a chance, type it in again, that would be really helpful. What is missing? Lack of advocacy, lack of strategy and lack of technical support. That doesn't look good. That looks like we've got a lot of work to do. Gosh. Okay. That's really good. We've got 28 of you responding now. There's still 71 people in the room. So uh, 29. So we're still, there's, if, if you've just joined the meeting, this is not a meeting to be sitting back and listening. This is a meeting for you to join in. So grab your phone, put in the code, go to menti.com. On, on any internet browser, put in the code at the top of the screen here and answer this question. What are the weaknesses of the global cluster? Okay, let's go forward. So now let's have a look at strengths. So tell me what you think the strengths are of the global cluster. What makes the global cluster strong? What gives them potential to do things, to do more, to achieve more? This is where all the people associated with the global cluster are crossing their fingers and hoping it doesn't go really quiet. I'm sure it won't. This idea of a diverse range of expertise and experience is something that came up before. So a lot of technical capacity, a lot of experience there, a lot of collective knowledge and experience and then also the commitment, you see committed practitioners, commitment of people. The large membership is a really important point, I think, huge amount of power and influence there. It's about harnessing that and seeing what we can do with it. Good access to donors. Yeah, that's a really important point. It's interesting how some of these things connect to strengths and weaknesses are actually two sides of the same coin, right? So a weakness might be that we need to do more around fundraising, but a, but a strength is we have pretty good access to donors. So perhaps we can look at how we can, how we can shape that and adjust it. Charlie, there's some comments in the chat as well. Oh, please, Rich, sorry, I'm trying to handle too many yeah, screens. Yeah. Tell me what's coming through, please. So I have, again, um, diversity of experiences, sharing of experience, sharing of information, learn about different contexts, um, again, sharing information and expertise. Brilliant, thank you. And I can see that's MICE um, and Naga Reuter. So thank you for those. If, you, if you're not able to use Menti, I should have said, do feel free to just contribute via the chat. We can't make it anonymous, I'm afraid, um, but really appreciate it. And another one also on capacity building. Good stuff, good stuff. Okay, so that is what we thought about in terms of strengths and weaknesses. So let's go back here now to this beautiful mountain with all the strengths and weaknesses there. So let's just recap. We started with role. We looked at who we are, what is our identity, vision, mission, values. Then we moved on to who do we work for? Who are our customers in inverted commas? Um, not the stakeholders who we interact with, but our, you know, our core customers. And, and what would success be for them? And then in light of that success or in light of what we need to do to achieve that success, what are we good at and what are we not so good at? And there it brings us to strengths and weaknesses. So the next thing we have to look at in terms of a strategy process is to look outside. My window's over there. Look outside. And, and look at the opportunities and threats that exist in, in, the, in the world at large, not just now, but into the future. And so this is a bit of a brain dump that came from a really interesting session with the strategic advisory group. And I'm very pleased to say that I've got two members of that strategic advisory group with us. So we've got Catherine Zieger, who is rapid response officer at IOM, 
and we've got Chris Gadd, who is Head of Emergencies at DRC. So Catherine and Chris, are you there? Uh, yes, Charlie, very much indeed, thanks. Hi, Chris, thank you. Catherine, are you there too? I am there, hi. Great. So I'm going to put you on the spot now and I'm going to encourage everybody else to put you even more on the spot. So if you're listening in and you've got a question about um, this diagram or about the in external threats and opportunities facing the global CCCM cluster, then please put it into the chat and we'll try to make sure we, we grill Paul, Catherine and Chris with some really difficult questions. So feel free to do that. I'll just, I'll dodge them and pass them to them. Don't worry. So, Catherine, I want to come to you first. The big thing happening right now is obviously COVID, right? COVID is everywhere. And whilst there is talk about vaccines and things, there is still a lot that has changed and a lot that has affected CCCM as a result. So I guess it'd be interesting to hear what you think the threats are for the global CCCM cluster in light of COVID. And then afterwards, maybe... Are there any opportunities that come out of, of COVID for, for us as a, as a cluster? Uh, sure. Um, I think some of the challenges that the cluster and the camp management has had to face during COVID, um, I think the biggest one is definitely the lack of face-to-face -face access to populations. Um, the foundation of camp management is supposed to be our presence in sites and the fact that there, we're there every day with the population to monitor services, um, listen to residents, advocate on their behalf. And while we've managed to ensure that operations continue in sites, I think the lack of daily interactions with people in the sites um, has really weakened our ability to respond and to represent them, the beneficiaries adequately in coordination um, at country level, at global level, at site level. Um, and I think the other biggest challenge that we always face that has been really highlighted during COVID is the poor living conditions in sites. And I think we we're used to working in environments where we have um, potentially poor hygiene or safety due to overcrowding and a lack of water. But with COVID, since it's spread through the close proximity and poor hygiene, it's really highlighted that people in displacement sites are often living in really bad conditions. And it's very difficult to improve these conditions, especially when the sites are unplanned or spontaneous or illegal. Um, it's a lot easier in a planned camp, but most of what we're working with now, not maybe not most, but a lot of what we're seeing now is spontaneous settlements potentially in urban areas. And it's really difficult to um, improve living conditions in these areas when we don't have land tenure or maybe government support from the government, et cetera. And, and a lot of those problems relate both at the very local response level, but also at the global level too. So I'm just gonna throw a question out to everyone here. So having heard what Catherine said about those challenges, what, what should the global cluster be doing. So if you've got some answers on this, put this into the chat. How should the global cluster be reacting to this, you know, this lack of access and, and these deteriorating conditions for a lot of displaced people? And I think that comes, Catherine, with this point about increasing displacement generally, right? So we've got all these challenges in the world in terms of conflict and, and insecurity, but with, with pandemics as well and the, the upheaval that causes, do you expect us to see, you know, displacement significantly increase? Oh, I don't know if that's a question for me. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. Well, then anybody, anybody out there, what do you think? Are we going to see, is COVID going to significantly change the amount of displacement in the world? Put it into the chat. Let me ask you the flip side then, Catherine, and that is about opportunities. And it seems a <clears> bit, <throat> it seems a bit um, Machiavellian, I think, to, to be looking at opportunities that come for a cluster as a result of a pandemic. But, but what do you think? Are there opportunities for the cluster and what can they do about it? I think um, like at global and definitely at country level, when COVID started at first, we were a little bit like, what do we do? But then there was really a spotlight on CCCM. And I think a lot of country operations and globally uh, humanitarian operation realized that IDP camps are really a priority in refugee camps and that we like people needed CCCM there to lead the response. And I think in some countries, CCCM really got a chance to show what it can do. I know for like in Somalia within two weeks, they had CCCM teams out there spreading messages, communicating with the community. Um, they really flipped their programming quickly to be able to respond to COVID and like put uh, site management at the head of that for IDPs. In Ethiopia, they had the SMS working group 
leading the priority, prior, prioritization of IDP sites that would um, receive wash and shelter upgrades. I know in Sudan, they started a, a temporary IDP working group to be able to support uh, living conditions and coordination of that. So I think COVID really showed that they, people need CCCM and that IDP camps are a priority and that living conditions are not okay and that we were the people to do it. So I thought that was good. Um, and then at like a site level, um, I think that one of the opportunities that came out was that um, community, since we didn't get to be in the site as much, we did have more community ownership um, because community governance and the people in the sites were forced to take over um, and they didn't have as much, they couldn't rely on site management as much. And so it really did improve uh, community engagement. And that is something that was not great to have to do it like that, but it did push um, a lot of sites to push forward on the participation aspect. Yeah, and th this idea of kind of almost forced localization for international organizations and increasing levels of participation because of exactly the context you've talked about is a really interesting opportunity, I think, in the humanitarian, se humanitarian sector generally. So again, just keeping everyone out there involved, do you agree with that? Is there an opportunity for CCCM here? You know, there is, everyone's taught, everyone's responding yes, yes, yes to increased displacement, right? So increased displacement, more coordination needed, an opportunity to CCCM to come to the fore and say, look, we can do this. This is our, this is our mandate. This is what we're good at. And, and, and I'd like to hear views from everyone. So in, in the chat there, if you, how do you think the global cluster should respond to try to step up and, and, and take that position? Whilst you're doing that, I want to ask Chris something. So thank you, Catherine. Chris, I, I just want to come to you about this idea of, on the bottom left of the diagram here, about changing role of national and local authorities. Um, so so there's, been, there's been talk for a while about the increasing and, and altering role of, of local authorities and different actors in terms of camp management. Over the longer term, what is, what is that going to mean um, what do you see as threats or opportunities coming out of that? Um, I wouldn't necessarily see it as a, as a threat per se, but certainly I think what we've seen in, in, in camp management or site management uh, response, as it's frequently been, uh, been, been phrased, is that, that the, the state local actors, I mean, take on a, a stronger role and they demand more within the, so like the three um, a key roles we have within camp management. So the uh, the um, the administrator, the coordinator, and the the camp manager. That state move states more frequently move into maintaining that the the camp manager role is is theirs. Um, at times they take on that role without necessarily having the full set of experience to implement the standards and the approaches as we think they should be carried out from um, the CCM cluster and from other practitioners. So that's somehow called for, and that's the opportunity that we try to position ourselves um, through a good relationship with the uh, with the state actors um, in, in terms of supporting them. So um, working alongside them and act de facto then in some situations, notably Greece as, an, as, a, as a clear example, taking on a big chunk of what would be the, the classical camp management role, but doing that, doing it somehow under the auspices of, um, of, the, of the official and, and state camp manager. It's one example. I think we've seen elements of similar in the, the Kurdish region of, of Iraq and a number of other places. And I think that's something we will see more of in future. And I think we need to be able to, to pitch ourselves and have the methodologies in place to go into the support role of the formal camp manager. Uh, of course, a different sort of like um, um, aspect is if it's a non-state actor that takes on a de facto management of, of a camp. I think less frequently would they take on what they would propose as being a camp management role, but but certainly they would be a potential actor. Um, and uh, for for the camp management agency and and CCCM all together, and that would raise uh, the bigger questions about the accountabilities uh, and also, I mean, 
the non-state actors maybe appreciation understanding of the humanitarian principles the opportunity is there in a, in a probably very difficult situation would be it would call for that we engage probably in partnerships with others in terms of humanitarian negotiations maybe some training on ihl humanitarian principles so i would say partnerships uh, and again in some kind of notching and and in part maybe supporting uh, role and in, in order to implement possible or uh, ensure the highest level of, of protective environment and, and dignity for the affected population in accordance with our uh, uh, principles and standards uh, uh, thanks uh, Charlie thanks Chris that's that's uh, that's fascinating so th there's definitely a in, in I think in everything you've said there there is a changing and adapting role for global actors and particularly global clusters here I guess a follow-up question from that is how soon is this happening are we talking about five years, 10 years, or are we talking about a changing role in the next one, two, three years? I think in my view, when it comes to the support to site management, if I may call it that, I think one could apply other different names. I think that's a trend we've seen for a number of years now. And, and I would personally be of the opinion that it's going to be more common um, because it, it's in line with the politicization of aid altogether. We see many uh, uh, nations to a higher regard wanting to be in control of the humanitarian response in full or in part and consider it, mix it up with somehow the, this, uh, the element of securitization. Um, so I think we'll see more of it and it, it, is, uh, it will be a big issue. It's a big theme related to humanitarian principles, IHL and, and the whole lot. But there's certainly, I mean, I think some, some room for, for us stepping in and trying to, uh, to, to uh, change, move the situation towards a higher respect for, for, for standards. So I think we'll see more of it, and I think we need to be ready for it. Yeah. And also, as part of that, I should maybe also emphasize, also develop, I mean, pretty clear red lines as to where we don't want to go. As we've also seen, I mean, related to mixed migration in a Libya context and many other places, I think it's apparent that there will be some some do's and some don'ts, um, and both will be uh, very important to elaborate and and have some collective uh, appreciation and understanding of and agree and agreement to. And I think those those areas of, of where you where you don't have a role, where the global CCCM cluster doesn't have a role, doesn't have a mandate, and consciously says, you know, this is not our this is not ours to do, this is not ours to get involved with, can be just as important in strategy as, as where they do. And, and the risk of this mission creep or just, just being pulled in different directions can also, when we talked at the beginning about identity, can really challenge the identity of an organization because they can't hold that identity if they're being pulled in multiple directions. I'm conscious that the chat is going a little bit wild here. Some really good points coming through if Juan or Jen or anyone's following it, are there any questions coming through that we can put to, to Catherine or Chris? Or are they just commentaries on things? What have we got? I'm, I'm seeing mostly comments at the moment. Okay, so Ingrid's saying there's an opportunity. Community were involved in remote management as humanitarian footprinting camps was limited. CCCM can continue to support with operational guidance. Again, this changing role and possibly have a CM portal where everyone can pop in and share learning. Good idea. Um, we've got Tarek saying there's an opportunity to boost localization as a result of this. Ashreen is saying um, she agrees with you, Catherine. That's good to know. Um, COVID has shown how important community engagement and participation is. Uh, we've seen uh, IDP committees, for example, have been taking the lead in response. Um, Jorn is there saying the cluster should own the two-way accountability of being the humanitarian actor providing access for people to services and access for providers to people. So this is like a, um, a kind of a, a conduit, a, a matchmaking role, if you like. Again, an interesting way to think about the purpose or the identity of the organization. I think what's clear is a lot is changing, um, both in the short term and the far term. And I think if the cluster is going to develop a strategy that is, is ready for that future, we've got to try to think ahead now. We, we can't develop a strategy that would work for us in 2020 or even 2021. We need to be thinking about a strategy that will work for us in 2025. So maybe one final comment from each of you, and that is, you know, overall, what do you see as, as the opportunity that the, the cluster should 
should take. So as we design this strategy and we think into the future, we're, we're looking to react to that. What is, what is the number one opportunity that you don't think we should miss? And I guess I'll come to Catherine first with that question. Ooh, I won't say number, I'm, this is my personal opinion on what I think we should focus on. Um, I don't know, I think because a lot of displacements, there's a lot of natural disasters that are occurring over and over in some places and people are being pushed into more urban areas and urbanization is increasing. I think that we should keep up our focus on the out of camp and urban um, CCCM activities uh, so that we can continue to offer services to people even if they're not in a camp like ex exactly a camp setting. And also localization I think is the most important way we could do that. Um, in the last few years, we've been working closer, like more closely with national NGOs and local authorities in some areas. And I think that if displacement is going to be more frequent, we have to be leaning on national NGOs to be able to be responding first rather than the UN agencies and international NGOs mobilizing to get there, et cetera. So we have to have capacities on the ground in these countries um, to be able to respond immediately. Thanks, Catherine. So I think more than one opportunity in there, at least three, but really, really good ones and important ones. So thank you. Chris, what about you? What's the big opportunity that we can't miss in defining this strategy? I think the opportunity that I would be concerned about, that is how we deal with protracted displacement. I would put the focus on then on, on the camps. We continue to have some mega camps, uh, many of which have been existing forever. And I can fear that we will see in the future increased displacement. And we can see that there is an absence of solutions to many conflicts, which mean that they will drag on. So all will, this will, will lead to me that many drivers that I'll speak to will have increased uh, protracted displacement. I think the opportunity for us is to take a, a stronger role um, with how to, to make then the protracted situations more dignified. Working with people's own capacities, their coping, moving towards livelihoods, uh, advocating much stronger for better services. I mean, we see many places actually funding into some of the camps, some of the big camps. It goes down year by year, which means that standards are getting further and further away from where they should uh, where they should be. So relaunching a bit with basically enhancing the protective environment, working with people's own capacities and improving the dignified and protective uh, environment with a view to solutions in future. So also, I mean, building people's capacities for a return or repatriation uh, process. I would be highly concerned. I see that as a, as a huge uh, opportunity and I think it's much needed uh, in, in the collective uh, human turn response. Fantastic, thank you both. Uh, I think the global cluster is really lucky to have people like Catherine and Chris on the strategic advisory group. And I think that's evident from, from the insight and, and the answers you hear there. Um, if you haven't had a chance to go to the chat and have a look, really interesting discussion on this. Um, it, it's, it's a difficult problem to solve, but I think there's a, there's a lot of consistent ideas coming out about, about these opportunities that we need to seize upon. So thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Chris, again. Um, we're going to take a, a break now, a short break, I reckon, maybe seven minutes. How about that? And when we come back, I'm going to tell you about what we've identified as the priority areas for the global cluster to work on. And that's based on the feedback we've had from surveys, from, from camp managers and other folk working at CCCM globally, and also from the views of the strategic advisory group. So come back, actually, let's just make it 10 minutes. I've got 43 minutes past here. So if you can come back at 53 minutes past and we'll share with you those priority work areas. So we'll see you in 10 minutes. Thanks, Charlie. Grab a coffee or a tea or something. So you're ready for what we're going to do next. Um, let's just see if you can put on your put on your camera just a minute, just so I can see if you're there, because I can't tell who's back and who's not. So give me a wave if you're back. Yeah, I can see Brian, Anika. I can see Dare, Yawn, Jeremiah. Thank you, Isabel. Wow, Alistair, why are they all there? Look at you all. This is amazing. Thank you, people. Thanks for coming back. Yaxan, don't drive and follow the, uh, the, the session. I don't want you to crash. Um, 
<laughs> Joseph waving in a very kind of uh, strange manner. Cool. Well, welcome back, everyone. Thanks for coming back. Uh, we must be doing okay if you came back. So remember, I said at the start of the session, these are our steps to a strategy. And we're now going to look, we've looked at one through five, we're going to look at six and seven here. And you'll remember that I said, this is where I'm really going to need your help. So get ready, because this is where I definitely want your input. So um, these are the priority work areas that came out of the survey results from different people working in CCCM globally and also the strategic advisory group. So these are pretty broad areas um, and they are the collation of lots of very specific things that people shared. So capacity building was broader than just capacity building to CCCM practitioners. It also talked, it talks about the cluster, but partners, authorities, and community as well. By sharing knowledge for quality programming, what people were talking about was providing up-to-date field oriented guidance, tools, and resources. So there's definitely an overlap there with capacity building, but we felt it was different enough that we should separate them to focus on, on deliverables in each area. The third area is about guidance. And this was specifically very close to number two here, but this is specifically about adapting to humanitarian trends. So up-to-date policy and guidance around changes in the humanitarian world and how organizations, teams, individuals should respond. Fourth, we have promote coordination with partners and other clusters. And this was really big. Lots and lots of people talked about they needed the support from the global cluster. And remember, we're focusing on global cluster here to help influence and promote coordination. So to influence other organizations and other clusters to try to enhance coordination opportunities. Um, that was both at a global level and at a local level sometimes. And one of the things that came out of that was really important was about having these clear defined roles and responsibilities. So without those, a lot of people were saying it was very difficult to set up coordination effectively because they didn't have the, those, those clear roles and responsibilities. So I just realized my camera's not on, here I am, um, to, to be able to do that. Five and six are about advocacy and positioning and then increasing funding. Again, they're fairly similar because the positioning and advocacy certainly helps funding and fundraising, but um, the two we felt were different enough to separate. So there are the six, capacity building, sharing knowledge, advice, guidance for programming, providing guidance on adapting to humanitarian trends, promoting coordination, advocacy and positioning for CCCM and increasing funding for the CCCM cluster. If you're able to, I'd like you to try and take a screenshot of that now because it's gonna be really useful to you in the next exercise. I will also copy the, the text into the, into the chat box in a moment. But before I do, let's go to this next, this next exercise. It's not possible for us to do everything all of the time. So I want to ask you to guide the global cluster on where they should prioritize. And we're going to do it this way. So we're going to go back to Menti. And I'd like you to do this task. And we did one of these with Jen yesterday. So I want you to imagine you've got 100 resources, $100, 100 people, whatever it is. It's a mixture of money and human resources. But you've got 100 is your total limit. You need to decide where you would distribute. If you were the global cluster, where would you distribute those resources? So put in this code and allocate your 100, 100 points to these six different areas. And let's see where we think the global cluster should be prioritizing its resources. Whilst you're doing that, I've just dropped the list on the previous slide into the chat. So it, Ingrid's just put in a, a comment. Um, so, and, and a, a really useful comment actually about how the CCCM cluster can, can share technical experience. But if just above Ingrid's comment, you'll see I've put these six things. So let's see where we think the cluster should be focusing its efforts. We've got 13 responses 
so far and we've got 28 percent of that funding so a quarter of it now 25 percent going to capacity building again if you're not able to access menti but you've got a really strong view on this and you want to just put it into the chat tell us how you distribute the uh, the resources there we're just coming up to 20 participants now on this and we're still at 25 percent so a quarter of the funding going towards capacity building and so advocacy is creeping up now. So a fifth around advocacy, a fifth around sharing knowledge. So those three at the top seem to be, all oh, capacity building has just taken a big jump up to 27. So keep coming if you've got, there are now 32 people responded. I'm really keen to get as many as we can on this. There are 77 of you in the session. Some of you might just be sleeping or you know doing your emails or something. But if, if you're not, then please uh, join. See if we can tip over the halfway mark for the first time in a mentee in this event. So this is really interesting at the moment. So capacity building represents nearly a third, somewhere between a quarter and a third of the resources that we think the, the global cluster should allocate. A way of thinking about this is there are roughly eight full-time employee equivalents, if you work in FTEs, in the global cluster. Um, so in any given year, that is about 100 person months. So every one of these points you're allocating could be regarded as a person month. So that could be quite powerful. That could be quite a lot of influence there. We've tipped over, by the way. So uh, folk working in the, this event, we've now got 41 responses from 76. So hooray, I'm very pleased about that. And what it tells us, I think, without a doubt, is that capacity building is the number one requirement, the number one priority area. And then I think these two areas, advocacy and positioning for CCCM and sharing knowledge about programming come in pretty close afterwards with about a fifth of the funding. Joe's written a good question. Isn't sharing knowledge a subset of capacity building? Yes, it is, Joe. Um, we felt it was important enough to distinguish because there's a difference between providing resources or toolkits to people versus um, offering capacity building programs, training, mentoring, coaching, all those sorts of things. And I just wanted to separate them out to see. But certainly, if you were to put those together, we're looking at over 40% of the resources into capacity building and sharing knowledge. Ingrid's coming with capacity sharing. Thank you, Ingrid. We've, uh, we've now uh, we've got a new, a new acronym. We should make that a hashtag. Okay, I'm going to move away from this. We've now got 45 responses. So thank you so much much this is fantastic i think i'm just going to stick this straight into the strategy this is how we're going to allocate resources for the next five years so well done people um let's then take you back to these six areas what i want to do now is i want to go a bit more in depth and i'm gonna i'm gonna ask you to go to breakout rooms uh in a minute i'm gonna ask Juan if she can allocate everyone into breakout rooms and i want you to discuss these so if you haven't already take a screenshot of this or go to the chat where I've, where I've dropped the text. There's a few more chats coming in afterwards, but it should still be there if you search for it. And I'm gonna tell you what we're gonna do first. So, first, I want you, when you get into your group, to agree which of those priority areas you want to talk about. You might have time just to focus on one. If you're really quick, you might look at two or even three. And what I want you to do is try to identify what you think the top three deliverables should be. And to answer this, I want you to think about three years. So I want you to think if we started next year, for sake of argument, and the global cluster worked its socks off, worked very hard for three years. If you're looking at capacity building, say, what would be the top three deliverables? What do you think the global cluster should deliver? in those three years. I don't really mind how you describe this. You could describe it as an activity. So it could be, you need to be running training programs, but try to be specific. Training programs on what, where, for who. You could describe it as an output, such as, I don't know, a uh, thousand people are trained. Or you could describe it as an objective, if you like to describe things as objectives. But I want you to come up with your top three for these different areas. 
The more areas you can focus on, the better. That will be fantastic. We're going to give you about 20 minutes to do it. So it's not a huge amount of time. If you don't have three deliverables and you just want to do one or two for one area and one or two for another, that's fine too. But the most important thing, I need you to write them down because when we come back, I'm going to ask you to put into Menti. Juan, I can see your hand up. How many people per room, please? Six, please. Whilst Man Juan does that maths in her head, you can see the, the brain click, 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 bing. Actually, She's Zoom, ready. Zoom does it for you. <laughs> okay. So get ready. Are there any questions, anyone not clear on what we're doing? Difficult to ask in a room of 68 people. Okay. So Juan, off we go to the rooms. We'll call you back in 20 minutes. Make sure you write down your answers. Oops. You should have something on your screen pop up and say you're invited to a room and you just need to click join there. If you haven't clicked join, then it won't automatically take you to the room. So just have a look there. You should see something on the on the Zoom toolbar. If you want to join a room, if you're still with us, if you're not engulfed in your emails or, or off making a cup of tea um, and you've not got an invitation to join a room, just let us know in the chat or, or put your hand up and just tell us or just unmute and tell us. I and the slide for the screenshot. Okay, um, thank you. That's a good point, Mohammed. So I'll just go back to that. I think in a minute, for anyone who hasn't joined the room, I would just like reassign them to another room in case they didn't see the first. Uh... Yeah, that's cool. That's cool. Let's have a look at the rooms at how we're doing. Some rooms are very good. Yeah. Mm, like some room, I think everyone's there, but I'm going to move some to room two. So in room one, we've got eight, but three people aren't there, so that's five. Room two, we've got five, two people aren't there, so that's, oh no, six. So that's four of them are there, four of them are in room three, four in room four, this is fine. Yeah. Five in, it says five, but there's only four in room five. And you've got six, six in room seven. This is perfect, thank you, Juan. Some space in 11. So if you're still in the main room, um, we're, we're in breakout rooms now. Um, Juan will try to reassign you to a breakout room. A little invitation will come up on your screen. You need to select join to go to that room. You're going to be in rooms for the next 15 minutes or so. And I just realized that I didn't share the, um, the link for the, for the form, for the feedback form. Shall I get it now? We could just, we could try doing it at the end. What do you think? Yeah, I think we can do it before you hand it over to us. Before I hand to you? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm just I'm conscious Sorry, that people... where are you? <laughs> um why give me a second, Karis. They, they didn't want me. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, let me uh, there you go.
Did you see it, Karis? Room three does, is not having a lot of luck for some reason. It's the magic number. Mm. I was kicked out of room three. Yeah, but 11. I'm trying to send you to 11, but you're not clicking, you know, join or whatever. Uh, no, there's nothing. Again, again, one last time. I mean, one last time. Maybe you can go back to three. Or three. <laughs> they don't want my opinion. <laughs> yeah, three and 11 are like the cursed numbers. Going to keep shifting people between them. But she's still having you. Karis, you're still not joined. Oh well. What happened? I don't know. <laughs> Wait, let me rejoin Zoom. Like I don't know. Yeah, okay. Okay. So one, if I send you the link to the form. Okay. Because otherwise I'm going in the midst of all this, I'm gonna lose it. Oh, it's not a very fun link. My only concern is, do we, do we then take, do we ask people to take a pause to fill it in before the wrap up? You think, you don't think we'll lose people? Hmm. Uh, huh. I can try and do it in a way that's, that's um, true, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I can try. I can try and do it. I'll do. I'll do. Um, I use the British Airways pilot approach. The voice, like everything, is going to be fine. No, uh, a long, long, long time ago, I took a flight uh, to Mexico, and um, the pilot did this brilliant thing where he said, uh, "You know, this crew is about to work for eleven hours as they take you over the Atlantic, and they're going to be nonstop." They've already been working for the two to three hours to prep everything for the plane. They're going to be working there on a 14 hour shift nonstop. What we're asking is you spend 30 seconds to watch the safety video. Can you do that? And we were all like. <laughs> yeah. No. It was good. <laughs> it's true. Some of them are very good. So our number of participants has jumped around quite a lot because uh, it was it was really low and then it seemed to be a bit better, but then it's dropped down to about 68 or 65 or something. So mm. people are tired. I also, I also think that a lot of people would as, like see this as more kind of internal conversation. Mm. I think True. the strategy, um, yeah. True. I think it's, it's going to give us some useful um, content though. I think that yeah. allocation of resources is really interesting because to be honest, I mean, depending on how far you want to go, you could just align your budget to it. And you could just say, okay, you know, we've got running costs, but once you take running costs out, out of that, are we spending, or at least a sense check, like people are asking us to spend 28% of our budget on capacity building. Are we, mm. are we there or are we spending 50% or 10% or, you know, ballpark figures? Yeah. Bit risky. I mean, I, I think like I think funding is tricky for us. Um, and um, just because I think in general there's only a small portion with dedicated, you know, funding. Whereas uh, and we just kind of oh hi Jessica. 
Let me find you a room. It's just not, not quite connected to audio, so can't hear you just yet. Oh, okay, well, I assigned her anyway. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna do this with my team now. Can you please go to room five? Yeah, you're gone. Oh, we're recording this. Brilliant, okay, thank you. So I'm going to move on to the next one now. If you haven't put in your capacity building deliverables, please type them in now really quick. Going to move. Set target on training of national local organizations. I like it. I like it. Local NGOs, training for staff, local NGOs. Good, good, good. Camp closure training. Good, good. Okay, we're going to go to the next one. So if you worked on knowledge sharing, please type in your deliverables now just on knowledge sharing, not on anything else. So if your group discussed knowledge sharing, please type in your deliverables now. Okay, that translation of materials is important. Out of camps and urban settings, big, big topic. Improve knowledge learning, identify key questions and develop evidence base. So that sounds like it's starting with a sort of a needs assessment. It's starting with asking people what, I, what is the, the knowledge that, that is most pertinent at the moment. If I've got that wrong, tell me in the chat. safe referral data protection. These are really good because these are a bit more specific. UDOC, UDOC. I like this one. Knowledge sharing can be linked with capacity building as a super priority of the global cluster, perhaps with a different modality. The sharing tools, case studies from between country contexts for adaptation. Interesting country to country learning as well, rather than everything perhaps needing to come through the center would be interesting. Confidentiality, local authorities. Okay, I'm gonna give you 10 more seconds and I'm gonna move on to the next one. I need some countdown music. I haven't got any lined up, so I'll just sing to you. Okay, good, good. Those of you who've been in the UK will know what that is. Okay, I'm gonna move on now to the next one. So if you worked on and guidance on humanitarian trends, so this was specifically about humanitarian trends. If your group discussed this, then put in your deliverables now. This is where group seven pay the price for being such you know, good students and getting everything done. They have to put them all in. Maybe it is just group seven, we're just waiting on them. We can do this one quickly. If, you've, if you have a brainwave, you know, if you weren't, if you didn't discuss this in the group, but you have a super brainwave about a, an absolutely essential deliverable under any of these topics, then, then feel free, bend the rules, throw it in. We'd rather have it than not have it. And if any of the things that pop up inspire you, then, then let us know. Nexus localization, something we've talked about. Nexus has come up again. Preparedness. This overlaps a lot with that idea of the knowledge, right? So we've got capacity building. It's like, one, it's like a Venn diagram, right? With the circles overlapping. So you've got capacity building, we've got sharing knowledge, which overlaps with capacity building. And then overlapping with both of them is these humanitarian trends. Ooh. 
localization. Advocating, this is interesting. We do a lot of the job that advocates for other clusters, humanitarian actors. We have difficulties in advocating for us. These priorities are interrelated. Interesting. Okay, 10 more seconds on this one. If you've submitted, but it's not come onto screen, it will pop up. Okay, let's go to the next one. So promoting coordination. This only received 8% of the resources. According to folk, only 8% of the resources were to be put to this, which I was quite surprised by. I thought it'd be a lot more, but let's see what you had in terms of your deliverables. So what are the deliverables? If you discuss this just on promoting coordination, Nation, if you discussed it, what are the deliverables? I'm just catching up with the chat. I have to admit the chat's confusing me a little bit. Cynthia, I'm, I'm really grateful for your comment, but I don't know what it means, but thank you. I appreciate it anyway. I think it was your singing. Oh, okay, cool. Yeah, no, that definitely, that's a lie then, Cynthia. Don't tell lies, please. <laughs> that's not a good thing to do. Okay, Keep find you. <laughs> Thank you, Cynthia. Um, find new ways of bridging people and, and providers. Local grassroots should be enhanced. Promote, coordinate advocacy and funding. Any more? Oh, plates getting dropped in the background here. Any more for any more? Roll up, roll up. Last chance. Coordination with authorities. This is an interesting thing, right? This is what Chris was talking about earlier, about this idea of working with authorities and coordination with authorities. And does the global cluster have to play a role in providing advice to local clusters, regional clusters to coordinate with authorities, or do they step in and play a role themselves in coordinating with authorities? It's an interesting question, I think. We've got some coming into the chat too. So bringing all actors across the nexus to the table from the onset of an emergency for smoother transition for emergency response to more durable, sustainable solutions. Okay. So let's go to the next one. So then we've got advocacy and positioning. So we've talked a lot about this. We've talked a lot about kind of making CCCM visible and making people understand, helping them, not making them, sounds a bit like interrogation, helping people to understand the importance of CCCM, why it's so pivotal, why it's so critical. What do we do? What do you want the global cluster to do in the next three years? By the way, one leans into this as if to say, right, what is on my work plan? What's coming around the corner? Dare rocks back in his chair and thinks, yeah, we got, we got it covered. We got it covered. Um, advocating for positioning CCCM in, lo in localization. Okay, this is interesting. What does that look like, I guess? So whoever wrote that, if you want to put some more into the chat or anyone else want to explain what that looks like in the chat, please go for it. We had some good conversations in the strategic advisory group about how we demonstrate the impact of CCCM and, and even comparing that with, you know, if you don't have CCCM, this is what the situation looks like. When you introduce CCCM, this is what comes as a result. And I wonder whether some of these scripts, some of these ideas, consistent messaging, some idea of, you know, let's all be talking, saying the same thing to all the different actors we talk to. That might be powerful. So work on better explaining CCCM, there you go. Again, we do a job that advocates for other clusters. We have difficulties in advocating for us. And I think this is where that's really pertinent. So thank you to whoever put that point in again.
interesting point from Joe there about um, about the role of a central cluster versus um, you know other uh, actors within the cluster in terms of research and learning. Worth having a look there if you haven't seen it in the chat. Visibility for all cluster of number of staff, number of sites, number of agencies. Yeah, sometimes those those kind of quantitative figures in terms of demonstrate power and influence, which is really important. Okay, let's move on now to the to the money. Let's move over there to the cash. Um, so, what are the deliverables in terms of fundraising? If you worked on fundraising, put them in now. This is where we see the big numbers come, Juan and Dare. So watch out for this. Strap yourselves in. We're going to see some some noughts here. I think zero zero zero. One hundred million dollars. Come on! Don't tell me no one's going to give them a target. Give them a target. <laughs> I'll give them a target. I'll get on my phone. Like our weight in gold is at the... Exactly. I think at least. I'm going on diet now. <laughs> is it worth It's our virtual weight. Oh, very clever, Derry. Clever. Okay. A global CCCM fundraising strategy and recruitment of an expert to support the development of the strategy. Interesting. Can I add to that and to go out and raise some money? So if you're going to get that expert in to develop the strategy, get someone who can go out and knock on some doors too. Global communication strategy. So that relates to both this one and the previous point as well, doesn't it? Joint fundraising. We need to go together. Agree. Who with? Who's who's who are the people there? Don't leave us. Don't leave us in the lurch. Tell us who those people are. Who's who's we and who's together? We need funding for the 16 years of care and maintenance. I want, I think I might know where that has come from, but I think <laughs> it's a good point. Right. So are we looking at short term funding or longer term funding? And again, that comes down to identification of donors, right? Because there's this thing about don't, there is donors who want to who fund immediate emergency response. And there are donors that are more interested in long term things. Increased visibility, especially on products, etc. as this will show the value of the work being done. Involve local NGOs and management, yeah. A, a huge area of fundraising that is often under, under focused or under tapped, if you like, is, is diaspora. And the involvement of local actors to reach out to their diaspora in other countries is often really powerful in terms of fundraising. I'm not a fundraising advisor, but I've seen it. So okay, I'm brilliant. Catherine respond to the, I guess this is a joint fundraising question. I, mean, I didn't say joint fundraising, but then I thought about it and chimed in on the chat. Good stuff. It's a possible collaboration. All of these collaborations are, are potentially good ideas. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pause there. I'm going to go back to our, our PowerPoint a moment just to, to carry on. Thank you so much for doing that. I'm sorry that that recap was a little bit slow. Um, we were trying to work out several different ways of doing it. At one point, I had a, an idea that you could all work on exactly the same document on, on Microsoft uh, OneDrive. And then I think some more sensible colleagues pointed out to me that it would crash in no time at all. Um, so that's, um, that's going to be really helpful for us. And we're going to take it forwards. So. I just want to talk a little bit about these remaining steps that I mentioned. So I talked about enabling strategies and contextual strategies, and we're in the midst of this work. So the strategic advisory group has started this, but it's not finished. So really, I just wanted to tell you a bit about what we're doing in trying to achieve that. So when we talk about enabling strategies, what we mean are what we need to do to strengthen or get better at those areas. We talked about strengths and weaknesses earlier. And here's an example. So capacity building is obviously a really important big area. And so some of the ideas that have already come out of discussions are offering solutions, not just services, making sure training materials are useful and relevant. And that might happen through some sort of an audit or feedback on training materials, um, prioritizing which need to be updated first, broadening the channels to distribute training. A lot of conversations about training, there's some training courses, some training um, opportunities and resources that are very useful but maybe they're not getting to the people who really need them or could really make most use of them. So we need to broaden those. 
So there's a lot of work going on on that. Here's, a, here's one of the areas about sharing knowledge for programming, quality of resources, distribution of knowledge, an interesting one about overcoming competitive mindset between organizations to make sure we're all working towards the same aim and addressing the gap in guidance around the transition phase was a particular area of sharing knowledge. Um, a lot more have come up from the discussion we've just had and the exercise we've just done. So we'll be feeding those in, so thank you. In terms of contextual strategies, this is a little bit more complicated. You may have worked on this already, but just for those of you who haven't, what the SAG is doing at the moment is it's taking the opportunities and threats that have been identified and it's comparing those with where we believe, and thank you for your input, where you all believe the global cluster has strengths or weaknesses. So depending on whether the cluster has a strength or a weakness related to an opportunity or a threat determines the strategy. And I won't read it all out for you because I'm sure you can. But this is one of the things I see lots of organizations who work on strategy, who spend ages working on their strengths and weaknesses. They spend ages working on identifying the opportunities and threats. And then they don't think about what that means. And one of the most important things to do here is to say, if this is an opportunity for which we have a strength, how do we maximize that? What is the advantage strategy we use? And, and the, the strategic advisory group, SAG, have already started to identify advantage strategies, conversion strategies, protective strategies, and defensive strategies in response to the different opportunities, threats, strengths, and weaknesses that are coming out. That's not finished, but it is underway. So what's next? So step 10 is really next steps. So thank you again for all of the input from today. We are going to make sure that feeds in um, to the strategy work. We're going to continue the work on enabling and contextual strategies, drawing from the strengths and weaknesses, identify the potential opportunities and threats. And then over the next couple of weeks, I'm going to develop a document that tries to capture all of this and share it with the strategic advisory group for editing. At some point in the future, we hope that document may be shared more widely for consultation. And then when that's finished, what we'll have is, is an overview document of the strategy. So the areas where the, the global cluster aims to focus, the degree of prioritization for those areas and the strategies that support that work, both enabling and contextual. Once that's in place, that then will give us the opportunity to start developing really clear objectives and work plans. And that will, that will determine then the work that the, the global cluster will try to undertake and try to deliver on each year, which is why I was asking you guys all about deliverables. So I thought maybe we could actually take some of those and stick them in. Perhaps they're not quite specific enough at the moment, but they're certainly giving us a good direction. And that's it on strategy. Before I close completely on strategy and move on to the next thing, I just want to, you've been so uh, engaged and, and really input a lot today. I want to give folk a chance to answer, ask or, or pose any reflections or questions. So um, if you do have a question, or any reflections that you want to put into the chat, or you just want to raise a hand, raise a virtual hand, um, or a real hand if you've got your camera on, uh, or just unmute and shout at me, that's okay too. Let's give you a couple of minutes just to see if anyone does. If you're a slow typer like me, you might be halfway through writing a question right now. If you don't have any questions or there aren't any further comments on this, um, if you'd like to be involved in strategy stuff going forwards, I think it would be the more voices and the more reflections and opinions and experience that we can build into this, the better the strategy, that's for sure. We have to coordinate that and make sure that works in a way that is efficient, effective. But if you would like to be involved in the strategy stuff in a more detailed way going forward, please contact Juan or contact Dare, contact me if you like, um, and just let us know because we'd be really keen to get more ideas into this. Okay, so I'm going to close strategy things there. I don't see anything new coming into the chat. I'm going to, in a moment, pass over to Juan and Dare for the Academy Awards of the global CCCM cluster, 
which you were involved with at the very beginning of today's session and you fed into. There are a few more awards as well, I believe, that are going to come out. So get excited about that. But before I do, I want to ask one more favour of you. And, and before I do that, just let me kind of wrap this in saying this event's taken a load of work to put on. It's been really difficult because we've not been able to meet face to face and lots of people have done lots to try to make it happen. And we're conscious that some of it's gone well, some of it's maybe not gone so well. And we'd really value your feedback. We've developed the tiniest, it's so tiny, it would fit between my thumb and finger there, the tiniest feedback form. It has five questions. I think it'll take you a maximum of two and a half minutes. So what we're gonna ask is that you take those two and a half minutes now. Um, I think Juan's gonna drop a link into the chat. There it is. Please take two and a half minutes, complete that feedback form and be back with us for the CCCM Academy Awards in about two and a half minutes. transparency and accountability on, on our front, on how the votes were counted. Um, it's, uh, so uh, shall we start with the, um, with the first one? It was a difficult selection to counter the balls, you know, the winner. I mean, it was even more difficult than the latest election that we have seen recently on TV. So uh, I will start with the first question on the award. One. Please tell us what does it say the award on the your favorite session in the retreat. Right. So in third place, dun, 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 we have localization. And then in second place, oh, we have the obviously the practitioners day. Very yes. close. Oh, very, oh my god, this is so exciting. I didn't realize how exciting this was gonna be. In first place, participation, inclusion, and accountability. Unmute and applaud, unmute and yeah, applaud. Yeah, please unmute. Yes, unmute everyone. Make some noise. Ah. Hey. All right. And now we will move to the following question. What was the funniest moment of the week? I'm sorry. I'm now sorry. mute again, quick, because it's really noisy. Yes, please, <laughs> That's yes. true. Um, in third place for this, I'm sure it's a Thai third place. Um, the it was um, the first one was the music from Yon. Don't fence me in, obviously. <laughs> the other ones, I don't know how many people saw, but there were some finger actions going on um, in the screen. <laughs> <laughs> and then second one was Tom's face when Jennifer's lost connection yesterday. Of course, in first place by a mile was Annika's performance on day one. <laughs> All right, <laughs> I'm ready. Hey. So, Annika's real Oscar winner in this. Well done. Uh, moving to the third award. Where should the retreat take place next year? All right. <clears throat> in third place, this is, I'm assuming it's one town in particular, but Turkey came in third. Not bad, not bad. Second place, Latin America. I'm sure Veronica, has Veronica been buying votes in this round? Um, first, first place, Kigali. Ooh, the right place. <laughs> All right. Hey. Now, Kigali wins, everybody. And now we are moving to another question. What was the biggest ops moment in the retreat? Juan, who wins here? We have um, Jennifer burning her muffins on... Uh, which day was that, Jen? When was? It was participation day. I was so <laughs> enraptured with the discussion from Yasmin. <laughs> I know, totally. And then obviously our biggest oops moment was 
all the videos that didn't play <laughs> these two weeks. <laughs> okay, so my turn to ask some of the questions. Duh, are you ready with the envelope? So these questions were put to us to um, agree on, well, vote on. Um, the first one is, which country do we think are most likely to use the CM standards next? Well, dot, 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 dot. The CM standards have gone through immense, immense progress in the past few weeks and the old countries soon should apply it. Based on the interest and the questions yesterday we had, we are thinking that it's going to be a tie between these countries, South Sudan and Iraq. Who will get there first? We will see later. I hope, I hope that will, uh, yeah, will have more place in the tie. And um, question from the floor, who would be the best future chair of the localization working group? <laughs> This is a tricky question because we do have procedures on the formation of working groups under the global cluster. This involves discussions with SAC. Meaningful localization has definitely become more and more central, broader in the humanitarian discussions. In these past two weeks, it was obvious. And in the last exercises we have done, it's very, very clear that localization is an issue that we really have to focus on. And this has to involve strong leadership, engagement, and expression of interest by anybody on this is welcome. Right. I think perhaps it's a good place to also mention that to join the global CCCM cluster in order to be part of these discussions, I invite you to go to our cluster website um, and make sure that you're there to participate, engage, and potentially also take on a bigger role in the governance and leadership in the cluster. So. Indeed, don't forget the membership, all the members. We are now open, please apply. Now, my question to Juan. Juan, what was your favorite video during the entire event? <laughs> so, in deliberation of this question, I mean, to be honest, I think Charlie's uh, strategy video came really close. Um, to, to this award with the fruit um, salad. Um, but I think, and I think I speak on behalf of many of you, like I think the clear winner of the favorite video moment was um, the one from Uganda by Fernanda um, that was shown during the participation day. And I think it was so strong. I think it let us take a moment to listen to people who are displays and draw from the importance of having your voices heard and having representation while displaced. So if, I think that was like, you know, big heart moment for me. Now, since we are done with the words, and I think we have many Oscar winners, uh, I would like uh, in closing and before handing it over to one who has been the real, real champion of the entire organization of this retreat from the beginning to the end. And it's very good that she survived. Yes, a big clap to one, first of all, really. Oh, wow. Really great and amazing. And before also I go to what I would like to say, I would like to thank Charlie. Charlie, it was an amazing effort, really. Uh, it was really a good journey for us. I think everybody enjoyed. Thank you very much, Charlie, for, for this amazing, amazing experience for all of us. And then to the members of the strategic advisory group, once again, you have done a great work. Strategic advisory group has been beyond the planning and the advising, and then they have been strongly present. So once again, and I think the working group chairs have done an amazing job. And this was really, really excellent. So once again, great. But the biggest clap I would say and the biggest toast I would give it for the participants from the field, those who have joined from different time zones and who showed extreme interest and the level of participation in the chats and the learning curve for us as the global cluster coordinators, one and myself and the SAG members and the Charlie and the working group members has really been essential for us to learn from you and your contribution. So really, really hats off to all of your participation and the presence, very much appreciated. And 
I will not take very long as even a plan because I think one has to take longer on that. But I just want to say that it was touching really for us due to the fact that COVID did not allow us to meet in person. It is already an important and probably the most important event along the year for the cluster, global cluster staff in, in general is to see you in person, to have social gatherings with you, to really the physically feel your presence and uh, to hear a lot from, from you, but we could not do it. So it was really, really difficult. But in the meantime, I really like the fact that we did not stop. We continue. We had over hundreds of people every moment with us in the session. So it's also a very moment of pride for us to see that the COVID did not stop us. I'm really looking forward to meeting you all in person. And thank you all very much from my side. Over to Juan, but I just, again, thanks to all the people who were working behind the scene, the teams from IOM in particular, I will not mention the names, and all the working groups have been really heavily working, and all other colleagues who are joining us to uh, uh, help us organize this session. So thank you all very much for this. Juan, over to you. Thank you, the, um, I feel like, you know, this year we set out to do a couple of things when we started planning this event back in July, which now seems like a long time ago. And I think we've definitely managed to accom accomplish a number of them. You know, I think we've created an online environment that is engaging, considering the number of people that join in every day. I think it's not been too formal. And I think the participation of everyone in the chat on videos have been like really rewarding for the team organizing it. I think making it feel less distant and less like online. Um, we've, I think we've reached out and engaged a whole range of people who would normally not be joining our discussions or not able to come in for the face-to-face -face meeting. I think it's definitely been a roller coaster ride and we've learned a whole lot in this process. I think as Der said, the organizing teams have been amazing this whole time, not just our like tireless global support team, but the members of the cluster, the SAG and our very courageous working group chairs. We certainly couldn't have done it without Charlie. So, you know, my sincere thanks to you for bearing with us and for getting us through the event and coming out stronger on the other side. And I think most important of all, I'm sure I speak on everyone's behalf in thank you, all of you who've logged in, call in, taking time from your important work to make this event such a great one. So I think here's to 2020. Thank you and come visit us again. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I think that's a wrap for us. Um, please do keep in touch um, with us, with anyone you met during the, the event and take care. Thank, Thank you, you very all. much. Take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks everyone. Bye. Bye. See you take soon. Care. Bye. Take care everyone. Bye. Bye. After two Bye. 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 Gracias. Bye. Bye. Gracias a todos. Gracias. Muy duro, obrigado. Gracias.